Hello, Scott Anderson speaking on our latest session in this series on Victorian art pottery. This time to look at the Bretby art pottery in Derbyshire. In number five of this series, we looked at Christopher Dresser's designs for the Linthorpe art pottery one of the pioneering factories that truly set the standard for much of the art pottery that was to be made in the next quarter century. Whilst Linthorpe was a very important precursor to most other art potteries, in fact, it only had a run of about 10 years. But it spawned at least two other companies fairly directly. The Bretby Art Pottery of Henry Tooth, and also his sometime partner, William Alt, whose William Alt & Co art pottery also uh, came, I suppose, fairly directly from the roots set by Linthorpe. Bretbyware is the subject of this present session and deals with one of the most long lived of all the Victorian art potteries. It didn't, in fact, end production until the 1990s. So it uh, lasted for over 100 years as a producer of, as it says, on the post you're looking at the moment, the leading artistic pottery. Also adds, of course, that it was moderately priced. And that's possibly why Henry Tooth & Co was so successful for so long from its pottery at Woodville near Burton-on-Trent. And here is Henry Tooth. Henry Tooth you've already met if you've looked at the session in this series on Linthorpe, but here he is again. Henry Tooth and William Alt became partners. They started the Bretby Art Pottery at Woodville, Derbyshire in 1883, following Tooth's departure from Linthorpe the previous year. There are records that tell us that production started in October of 1883, that year, with 113 items being produced. 30 large plant pots, 32 bark plates, seven footed tobacco jars, and 15 vases. It was an interesting assortment for what must have been their first full commercial firing. By the end of the year, so successful uh, what had the pottery become, that at least 10 people were employed at the factory. The story of Brett the Art Pottery is really the story of Henry Tooth and unexpected opportunities. Born in Buckinghamshire in 1842, Tooth began his working career at age 14 at a brickworks. Later, he tried his hand at being a butcher. A rather strange choice, you might think, for someone who was to become so well known in English ceramic circles. But eventually he ended up in the world of art, exercising his natural gift for drawing and painting. From work in a theatre, painting scenery, he graduated to interior decorating, working on private house commissions, churches and public buildings. While decorating the town hall at Ryde on the Isle of Wight, his work came to the attention of Dr Christopher Dresser, who was so impressed that he recommended him to John Harrison as a pottery manager for Harrison's projected new art pottery at Linthorpe. The recommendation seems somewhat strange as Tooth appears to have had little or no knowledge of ceramics and their production. However, Harrison accepted Dresser's suggestion and in 1878, a short training period for Tooth was arranged for the Derbyshire pottery of T.G. Green. That was quite useful because it was actually on his way north from the Isle of Wight to Middlesbrough. It was here that Tooth was to meet William Alt, 
who worked at TG Green and Co. Presumably, the two men found that they had something in common, for it was old that Tooth turned to in 1883, when he wanted to start up his own pottery. But that was still some way in the future. Having learned the basics of pottery production in Derbyshire, Tooth continued on his journey northwards to Middlesbrough, where he took over the organisation and day-to-day -day running of the new Linthorpe Art Pottery, probably in either late 1878 or early 1879. It is worth noting in relation to Tooth's appointment that the Linthorpe Works was initially designed to produce more than just ceramics. Dresser's original concept for Linthorpe was as a more diverse art manufacturing, producing wallpaper and glass, as well as pottery. Tooth had plenty of decorating experience and had worked with stained glass, and it was possibly this that made him appear suitable for the management position at Linthorpe. In the event, it was the pottery that was launched successfully, and the other projected areas of activity failed to develop to any degree. The earliest prototype pots Linthorpe may have been made in late 1878 and certainly at least one pot dated to February 1879 has been recorded. By mid-1879 full scale production was underway and in the autumn of 1879 the pots were first displayed in Middlesbrough and then in November in London at the warehouse of Dresser and Home, who you heard about in the previous session. Henry Tooth seemed to have made a successful career move. Unfortunately, after early success, the impetus behind the project seemed to have faltered. The planned wallpaper and glass production came to little, and even the commercial development of the pottery started to look uncertain. By 1881, Dresser was distracted by numerous problems in his other business ventures, and his health seemed to have been causing him concern. In January 1882, Dresser ceased to be the art superintendent of the Linthorpe Works, and shortly after, Tooth left Linthorpe to start up his own pottery. While at Linthorpe, Tooth developed new glaze effects for decorating the pots and developed a definite interest in ceramics. However, this was not enough to keep him at Linthorpe. His relationship to Dresser may have made life difficult at the factory and particularly with Harrison, who took over the promotion and sale of Linthorpe artwares from Dresser in 1882. Harrison was no longer enamoured with Dresser, and this may have also caused a rift with Tooth. Also, there were rumours that Tooth was spending time on interior decorating projects on his own account, rather than putting time in at the works. Whatever the reasons, in the spring of 1882, Tooth was once more heading south. On his return to Derbyshire, he joined forces with William Alt and started the Brett B. Art Pottery. The company began business as Tooth and Alt on the 25th of October 1883, following a series of experiments that had begun as early as March of that year. Initially, they were housed in the premises provided by T.G. Green at his Church Gresley Pottery, but the company was so successful so quickly that it outgrew this first accommodation. In 1885, a new works was constructed in Swaddling Coat Road, Woodville, Derbyshire, and this was to become the permanent home for the pottery until its closure in 1996. By this stage, the company was already a recognised name in the ceramics trade. In 1884, Brett B. had won a gold award 
at the Crystal Palace exhibition. And in the same year, the company Sunburst, or Rising Sun trademark, was registered. And we can see the company's Rising Sun trademark uh, on the uh, screen at the moment, on the base of this rather attractive small green vase that's shown. The mark is usually impressed, particularly in the early days of Brett Art pottery. Now, despite the firm's early successes, and for reasons that are still not clear, Henry Tooth and William Alt decided to dissolve their partnership on the 1st of January 1887. Alt left to start up his own pottery in nearby Swaddlingcote, and Tooth took on a new partner named John Downing Rag. The new company was now styled Tooth & Co, and this was the name of the company until 1912, when Rag left. The firm then being renamed Tooth & Co Limited. Tooth himself died in 1918, but the company continued in family hands until 1933, when it was sold to a Mr Fred Parker. Despite a lengthy closure during the Second World War, the works reopened in 1947 and continued with some success until its final closure in September 1996. And the picture on the screen at the moment shows you uh, the company's offices and showroom in Swaddlingcote Road, Woodville. This picture uh, was taken in the 1950s. As can be observed in this illustration, taken from the Pottery Gazette, Brett may produce the same sort of range of products that were issued by Linthorpe and also the Leeds firm of Bermontals. In the 1880s and 90s, jardiniers and stands, umbrella stands, decorative vases, ashtrays, and novelty animal figures were very much part of the company's repertoire. These early simple hand-thrown, or often, it must be said, moulded pieces, were sometimes given a monochrome finish, but frequently display the flown glaze effects pioneered by Tooth at Linthorpe. Some vessels display hand-painted decoration, usually floral sprays, but occasionally uh, animals and particularly birds. And much of this work seems to have been executed by Tooth's second daughter, whose name was Florence, who was herself a talented artist. In addition to these glaze wares, typically with a glossy finish, Brett B also introduced a number of series wares, some of which fall into the period under consideration. Carved bamboo ware was one such series introduced in 1895. This ware consists of a range of jardiniers, pots and pedestals, small planters, vases, and, commonly found today, wall plaques. The mouldy decoration displays Japanese figures and motifs picked out in a dull ivory coloured glaze set against a semi-matte or matte brown or black background. Examples are still commonplace in the marketplace today and can start for as little as £25. Early in the 20th century, a variety of ranges, some imitating bronze or copper, were introduced. These matte or semi-matte finished wares can display highly glazed ceramic cabochon jewels, some of which were acquired from the Ruskin pottery at Smethwick, Birmingham. Some vessels in these ranges are heavily influenced by the flowing lines of Art Nouveau and can display modelled female figures while others are more in sympathy with the arts and crafts movement and simulate a hammered finish, or even false rivets.
In keeping with the ceramic fashions of the day, lusterwares were introduced in the early years of the 20th century. This type of finish was used for both vessels and figures. In the 1920s, Nurton ware was a popular Bradley product and can be seen in a later illustration in this presentation. The range of series wares issued by Bretby in the 20th century was extremely varied. Many examples are not to contemporary taste and sell for rather small sums, usually within online auctions. Some series are aesthetically without great worth, although some of Bretby's Art Deco style wares are well designed and appealing. One of the best ways to study the range of Bretby's products is to look at the numerous advertisements issued by the company over several decades. Right from the start, Tooth realised the importance of advertising and his wares were advertised extensively in trade publications, especially the Pottery Gazette. So what to look out for in Victorian early Bretby art pottery? Well, certainly several Bretby shapes are similar or even identical to those produced at Linthorpe. Vessels can display hand painted work in addition to moulded decoration. Also, many wares are purely decorative in nature, although a few tea wares were produced, as we will see in a short while. Early pieces carry the Bretby trademark and usually have fairly low shape numbers. Quite importantly, after 1891, the word England appears with the usual trademark. Uh, the words made in England, however, indicate a 20th century piece. Just to look at a few examples now of what Bretby looks like, we start off by looking at a rather strange looking uh, vessel. This is a Bretby bulb planter. So with this you'd plant bulbs and they would hopefully grow out of the holes in the side of the vessel or some of them might. It's finished in what was in that uh, period a popular monochrome green glaze. And you can find this same green glaze on a whole range of early Bretby products. It's rather an unusual vessel and the, the little roundels, sort of mon symbols on the outside are very reminiscent of the aesthetic movement. And of course, we are talking about ceramics first produced for an aesthetic public. On the screen now is an example of a Bretby teapot finished in originally a rather nice blue glaze, but then dipped in a flown glaze. So you have this wonderful blue uh, lid and upper rim and the rest of the body with this rather interesting mixture of colours. Teawares are not common in Bretby products, but they do exist and are rather nice to find. They were part of the factory's range from its inception. And most art potteries we find do produce a range of cups and saucers, often teapots. It seems to be uh, something of a bread and butter product for uh, most of the Victorian art pottery factories. Underneath this teapot, uh, we can see uh, the early mark of Bretby, the uh, rising sun mark with Bretby underneath, stamped. There doesn't appear to be a shape number, but it's undoubtedly an early piece. So if you look at the base of your uh, Bretby pots, if you are lucky enough to have uh, any in your possession, this is the sort of thing you're likely to see in the 1880s, prior to uh, the advent of the England mark that we've just mentioned. This is a rather attractive vessel and probably one of the earliest pieces of Victorian art pottery that I personally purchased. 
uh, for largely for its attraction. And you can see that much like the blue and then subsequently flown glazed teapot that you've just been looking at, this has a rather nice deep red neck and a flown glazed uh, base uh, or lower part of its body. Most vessels are moulded or indeed slip cast and early examples frequently display flown glazes. Tooth had developed a number of different glazes while at Linthorpe and used some of the effects that he had created on pots at Bretby and this is a good example of uh, that particular concept. Shapes are often simple and inspired by oriental prototypes. And though the range of Bretby pots is rather vast in terms of shape and decoration, it is in this early period, the 1880s running into the 1890s, that we see some of the more pure forms related to original oriental prototypes. As we can see from this other example on the screen at the moment, in keeping with what I have just suggested, bar shapes are often very simple in line. And one of the reasons for this is not just the oriental prototypes that were followed, but also so as not to detract, I think, from the glaze effects, which do tend to be uh, rather beautiful on a, a vessel type such as this one. Now, many vases can be large, things like jardiniers, uh, stands and pots, large vases, but certainly and very collectible are a whole range of smaller vessels, probably no more than about uh, 30 centimetres high, but many of them even within that only perhaps 12 to 15 centimetres or less. So vase sizes can range from a few centimetres, and this is a very small pot, I think it's about three, four centimetres high, up to a metre or more. Obviously, with limited space in perhaps modern houses, collectors often find these smaller pieces much more appropriate for their collecting activities. Here, we can see a hand-painted jardinier pot similar in shape to a model produced at Linthorpe. And this is a good example of how single coloured glazes can be mixed to change from one colour to another, but also utilised in the decoration of a pot with hand-painted decoration. And this is uh, perhaps somewhat unusual, but uh, rather nice and uh, produced uh, as we said, in a, a mould rather than hand thrown. And here is the Impress Factory Mark, an early shape number on the base of the Jardinier shown in the previous illustration. As we can see, uh, the glaze can sometimes obscure parts of uh, the Impress marks, but it's quite clearly here uh, the Rising Sun mark with Brett B and the shape number 691. No sign of the words England. So this is prior to the innovation of the England mark in the early 1890s. The range of Brett B products is quite enormous. And indeed, uh, although, as I've said, many of the early uh, pieces dated to the 1880s and early 1890s are inspired by Oriental forms, which tends to be a, a main theme in Victorian art pottery, as you can see here, some designs can seem rather out of place within the general range of art pottery shapes. It must be said that although after about 1900, almost anything goes. And again, you might think that the more unusual the shape, the later it becomes. Not always true, but you can get shapes that are very similar in design to this candlestick in the production of other art potteries. 
so they are not alone in producing unusual things. The same must be said for novelty products, and like most art potteries, Bretby produced an extensive range of novelty wares. Now, depending on how purist a collector may or may not be, uh, these can be um, incidental irritants, or they can be very much part of the collecting theme. Some people like to collect things uh, like this apple shaped vase, which you can see bears the Brett B mark uh, with a fairly early shape number, but this one produced after 1891 as it carries the England mark. The first time I think we've seen that in this uh, run of examples. Another very commonly found uh, series of novelty plates are the leaf moulded plates such as the one you see here and also serving dishes uh, that became a fairly important part of Bretby's production. They're quite numerous and often found so one suspects there were quite a lot of them and they are the sort of thing that people could use particularly for salad serving uh, summer meals in a, a household that is not particularly interested in the sort of oriental style art pottery that we've been talking about. Underneath this leaf moulded plate can be found a very interesting series of marks. From 1891, Bretby marks include, as we've said, the word England, but on this example, other marks include shape numbers, artist marks, and registered design numbers, as shown here above the rising sun mark. The words made in England denote a 20th century date, so we can see here that this one uh, dates to the 1890s. And you can see quite clearly the shape number 1116, and a rather lengthy uh, registration mark. Uh, the registered design mark, it's a little bit like a short run uh, patent, I suppose, usually lasting, I believe, for about three years, uh, which then has to be re-registered if that is the requirement for the pottery. Other novelty pieces include plates with fake biscuits and trays with ceramic nuts. Uh, for example, here are some of those fake biscuits. And this one, uh, when you look at the underside, the base of this particular piece, you can see there, again, the Rising Sun Bretby mark with a rather nice registered design number and a shape number as well. So you have almost everything there. They really are quite fun and collectors are often quite enthusiastic about them. But novelties nevertheless. Early production also includes a number of animal figures, some of them quite large. This particular one is uh, well over I think uh, 40 centimetres high. It's quite large. And this sort of thing was produced uh, from the late 19th century on into the early 20th century. And it's typical of the production of Brett B, who seemed to have always quite liked producing both human and animal figures. The human figures we're not really going to discuss here but certainly some of the animal figures might well be seen to be aesthetically pleasing and to be connected to the general run of Victorian art pottery. And if one looks at the oriental uh, predecessors, as it were, you can see that both Chinese and Japanese productions from the 19th century do include animal figures. 
Also, and something that seems to become quite popular in the late 19th century, as well as going on into the 20th century, I suppose, even up to the present day, are bookends, ceramic bookends. And here we have a bookend figure. Uh, there would have been two of them, of course. It's one of a pair. This is Mark Bretby, England, should date from the uh, 1890s to the early 20th century. Although looking at the glaze on this particular piece, I would expect this to be more early 20th century than late 19th. But it is rather a nice uh, little piece. And things like this are very collectible. Right from the start, as we've mentioned, oriental shapes and dectrice themes are very collectible. And here we can see an early piece similar to the uh, type of ware produced for that large polar bear on the block of ice that you've just seen a couple of images ago. This one, an oriental production with a dragon wrapped around it uh, with small glass eyes. They're quite attractive. And there you can see those small glass eyes. Rather a nice piece, though not, it must be said, to everybody's taste. Vases and other pieces with Japanese figural decoration are fairly common in late 19th, early 20th century Bretby production. Although this vase displays a rich green glaze, this design theme was perhaps more frequently rendered in Bretby's carved bamboo ware. And we'll show you an example of that in just a moment. However, looking at this piece, we can see that it dates to the period when England was stamped along with the shape number of Bretby Rising Sun Mark. And so it dates the uh, 1890s into the early 20th century. And we can see a piece which is both Japanese in inspiration with Japanese figural work but also looking at those handles, the sweep and curvature of those handles, the vitality of the line of those handles, it appears to show the influence of Art Nouveau. So sometime around 1900, just before, just after, would seem quite reasonable for this particular piece. And here is a typical example of a plaque, a wall plaque, in what was known as carved bamboo ware. First introduced around about 1895, these carved bamboo ware pieces are very, very common indeed. They have a rather nice, slightly shiny glaze for the main decorative theme in the centre of the plate, but with a rather less attractive dark brown to even black matte glaze around the rim of the piece. These tend not to be particularly popular in the collector's market today. And indeed, you can get rather nice plaques like this one for as little as 20, 25, 30 pounds um, at auction or even at antique fairs. Uh, they are not, it seems to be great sellers, but they do illustrate to us the design inspiration for pieces such as this. I do like or what appear to be a series of gourds hanging down uh, from a plant above the main scene. Bretby produced quite a number of different advertisements for their wares in the 1890s, early 20th century. And here we can see from the Pottery Gazette one such advertisement for Tooth & Co. Bretby Art Pottery. At the top, a rather matte glazed series of vases represent their Nurton Ware series. But at the bottom, we can see also current at this period, a whole range of Bretby Carr bamboo ware pieces. And if you are looking at the centre row of those Carr bamboo pieces on the extreme right, you can identify the same vessel shape as the green glazed piece we have just shown you. 
though this in of course the more normal i suppose glaze finish or decorative finish produced in the carve bamboo ware range also from this period in the early 20th century we can see with this vase a rather nice little slightly lustered uh, glazed vase which was quite typical of production in other art potteries at this time the luster was certainly something that many art potters experimented with in the late 19th early 20th century people like uh, pilkington's royal lancaster of course uh, i suppose predominate in in this area in terms of the marketplace there's a rather nice piece only a few centimeters high but very typical using a, a very simple shape but nevertheless very attractive this is uh, in rather stark contrast to the next piece on the screen now you can see a ceramic item that's very different from the rather simple luster decorated piece we've just been looking at we're now well into the 20th century and this i i include just because it's a rather interesting piece uh, that illustrates what was to happen next in the commercial side of designs for Bretby. Bretby wares produced in Art Deco style in the 1920s and 1930s often display motifs commonly found in popular art and design culture of the period, particularly that found in cinema decoration. This is typical of the pieces that they produce it's a rather nice example and it really does remind me um, of boyhood trips to cinemas built in the art deco style and you can see here a detail of one of these art deco designs it's a very attractive piece and i thought that it'd be rather nice just to uh, finish off with this um, sort of thing though we are obviously going well beyond Victorian art pottery and here as you can see underneath this piece we still have the Bretby rising sun mark we have a shape number uh, fairly high in the uh, numbering of the range at this time and very typically the made in England mark which shows us that it's well on into the 1920s or even later pieces like this are quite typical uh, in a variety of ceramics in the art deco period and uh, a nice piece like this very collectible indeed well that brings us to the end of this session it just remains to look at what literature is available If you wish to read more about Bretby, there are a number of sources. Michael Ash's short book, Bretby Art Pottery Collector's Guide, 2001, provides a good overview of the history and products of the factory and concentrates particularly on the range of series wares that were produced uh, by Bretby. It deals with a lot more uh, than the Victorian art pottery, which has been at the centre of our theme. Other books include Bergson's Encyclopedia of British Art Pottery, which usually has something to say about uh, all of the uh, British art potteries that you are likely to hear about. Um, and the rather rare book now, E.L. Thomas's book on Victorian art pottery, has some quite useful uh, comments on the pottery. Thank you very much for looking uh, into uh, this episode of the series. And we will hopefully have your company again uh, when the next session in the series is released quite soon. Thank you.